In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, Ali She Ahush was the chief of the Crow Nation of American, Native Americans. They lived in what is now Montana, on land they believed had been given to them by God, and they lived by hunting buffalo. In order to maintain their land, they were ever engaged in a struggle with other Native American tribes, particularly the Sioux and the Cheyenne. At that time, the culture of the Crow was a warrior culture, which revolved around planting and defending a territorial symbol called a coop stick. The prestige of Crow men depended on counting coop, or the prestige that attended various acts of war, and the prestige of women depended on how much coop her man had counted. When he was a boy, Alik She Ahush had a dream which tribal elders interpreted as telling the tribe that the white man was going to overwhelm the Native Americans and end the buffalo hunt, but that the Crow tribe might survive this devastation. The dream instructed the boy to be like the chickadee who learns and listens to all voices. His grandfather named him Alik She Alhush, which means many achievements, and predicted that he would become the tribal chief, which he did. He was called, in English, Plenty Coops, but in reality, he presided over the end of the coop counting way of war, and indeed, over almost all other aspects of Crow culture. As his dream did come to pass, the Americans won what they called the war for the West. In the midst of that, fundamental, disorienting change, Chief Plenty Coops stayed fixed on his goal, the one the dream gave him, to save his people by listening and learning from everyone, including the white man. In pursuit of that goal, he allied himself against the Sioux and the Cheyenne, sent children, tribal children to American schools, learned to farm, and continued to insist to Washington that his tribe remain on their sacred land. Other tribes saw this as selling out. Plenty Coop saw it as a creative adaptation to a sad necessity following the wisdom of his dream. And it is true that there was no trail of tears for the Crow people who remain to this day the owners of a large proportion of their original sacred land. Jonathan Lear, who tells this story in his book, Radical Hope, Ethics in the Face of Cultural Devastation, remarks on the irony of Plenty Coop's name and on the fundamental appropriateness of his crow name, Many Achievements. I spent most of my sabbatical in residence at Meadville Lombard Theological School, the UU Seminary in Chicago. Seminary education over the years, both in UU and in other Protestant denominations, has become extremely expensive in time and money and family stress. As the model created for single or newly married young men in the last century, which was move to seminary, take classes for two years, move someone out somewhere else for your internship for a year, move back to Chicago for one or two or sometimes three more years of school and the certification process, and then move again for your first church, that model had resulted in too many stressed out or broken families, graduates with unsustainable debt, and the perception that many people who might make very good ministers were not choosing ministry or were choosing to attend a seminary sponsored by another denomination which was located in their hometown and they're therefore coming into ministry without proper grounding in their own traditions. It's not exactly cultural devastation that Protestant seminaries face these days, but it's definitely a crisis. Meadville as an institution faced that sort of crisis that individuals face one of those change or else messages that from the universe that comes with illness, aging, the need to face up to addictions, retool for a job, face the empty nest, or relationships end. Life gives us, in the end, lots of those kinds of messages, change or else. 
messages which could be ignored, at least for a while, problems which could be put off and not solved, but they'll probably only get bigger but, and will ultimately have to be confronted. I have to admire Meadville. They took this particular bull by the horns and made radical changes in their way of being a seminary. Henceforth, all seminary students will find a church and a teaching pastor in probably their hometowns and spend a two or three year stint as an intern traveling regularly to Chicago for intensive classes. For many candidates, they'll never have to move, and if they're diligent, will be able to finish their schoolwork in three years. The hope is that this will make seminary education more affordable and feasible, and therefore bring more talented ministers amongst us. But in the meantime, as to say last semester, the faculty and the staff was rather in the position of young plenty coops, presiding over the end of the way things had always been, and amidst some considerable criticism, moving forward into a future which is envisioned to be radically different from the past. It was inspiring, actually, to be there, and satisfying to be a pastoral presence among the stresses and strains which I'm sure you can imagine. I admire an institution which will take the risk of making a fundamental change rather than continuing to be a sinking ship. I predict that the leaders of Meadville will be considered in the future architects of an important achievement. And it's not just ministry that faces a shaky future. Liberal religion in UU and many other varieties is also looking at a fundamentally changing world. Another of my sabbatical projects was writing a lecture on this subject. The Future of Unitarian Universalism, What's Possible, was the title I was given, and I was one of six speakers during a weekend of lectures in Boston in April. Here's part of that lecture. I want to talk to you this morning about how re the religious landscape has changed since the middle of the last century, my lifetime and what we as Unitarian Universalists are going to have to do if we want to survive and thrive and serve into the next century. I feel urgent about this. I was raised in this faith. I have found a place here during every era of my life, though my theology and spirituality have changed several times. It's hard for me to imagine a good life without Unitarian Universalism, and I'm worried about us. After three decades of very modest growth during a population boom, which can only be called a success when compared with our compatriots in the mainstream faiths, which have plummeted in numbers, we're starting to shrink too now. Unlike the Methodists and Presbyterians, though, we were minuscule to begin with. It will take very little shrinkage to make us no longer viable as a denomination. So if I sound cranky at times, it's the crankiness of fear. The world has changed around us, and if we don't adjust to those changes, we are going to die off. <laughs> when I was born in the middle of the last century, America was a church-going society. Some of you remember this. People who didn't go to church or synagogue kind of kept the fact quiet. There was nothing else to do on Sunday in most locales besides going to church. Polite persons didn't even mow their lawns on Sunday morning. And shopping was out of the question. If you got crosswise with your church, you decided you didn't believe what's creed or were angered by its policies, you licked your wounds and found yourself another church because belong, not belonging to a church was just not the way things were. Church was a necessity to a good life. It was especially necessary to a good life if you were raising children and people who thought of themselves as good parents sent their kids to church even if they themselves didn't go that much. In this social and religious landscape, Unitarianism and then Unitarian Universalism offered people the opportunity to belong to a free church and enjoy freedom from the requirements of doctrines and dogmas that they didn't believe. In those days, our successful niche was this. Unitarian Universalists are free to believe whatever we want to, and most of us don't. <laughs> and that was sufficient. But in 2011, 
This is an increasingly unchurched society. Plenty of people don't participate in any organized religious observance, church, mosque, or synagogue. Most parents who bring their children to church are choosing church over soccer, TV, shopping, family time, and chores, and many are bringing their children to church mostly because they themselves feel the need to come. Most, church children, most school children go to school with Christians, Jews, and Muslims, and those of other faiths, and many of their friends do not belong to a religious body at all. The right to believe what your own heart and mind suggest to you is true, including nothing, is taken for granted in much of elder society and in all of younger society. So when people, especially people under 40, decide they don't believe in whatever the church taught that they were raised in, they often go to ye for years without participating in any church at all. Because religion is no longer a privileged part of the social landscape in most parts of the nation. When they decide that they want to go to church again, it's not because they want freedom, they've had freedom. Nor are most of them interested in community, generally speaking. For general community, they have Facebook and volleyball leagues and going out for a drink after work and mother's groups and the like. No, when they show up at our door, when they, they show up looking for the one thing they can't get at the gym or the Democratic Party headquarters or the mother's group, they want a safe place to explore what happens to them when they start to deepen their lives. They are looking, in short, for a religious community, not a secular one. And the ones who try orthodox options and can't bring themselves in all integrity to sign on, or who already know what they believe and don't believe, those are the ones who might come to us. It's these people who are our natural constituency. Or to put it another way, these are the people we're supposed to be serving. That is our niche in the religious landscape. If we don't serve their needs for depth and heart, spirituality, hope, faith, and love outside of an orthodox setting, no one else will. Welcoming these folks into our congregations, and we are doing this here, so this may not sound quite as radical to you as it sounded to the folks in Boston. We know it can be done. Welcoming these folks into our congregations will require for many churches and for our denomination as a whole a fundamental change in our thinking about what we're doing, and it will require a different focus on who we are. So here's one way to express a focus for who we might be in the 21st century. Unitarian Universalists worship and grow in spirit in religiously diverse congregations. Just to give you a sense of how the market share of all religion has changed over 50 years, let me go over some statistics. Researchers have actually been asking 20-year-olds about their religious beliefs for several generations. So we know this, that 3% of the young people, the 20-year-olds of the World War II generation, said they had no religion, 3%. About 6% of the next generation, my parents' generation, people now in their 70s and 80s, told researchers that they had no religion. About 12% of the boomers in the 60s and 70s, when they were 20, claimed no religion. Now, all these folks go on to become more religious as they age, but in their 20s, 3%, 6%, 12%, my generation, Gen Xers, 20% people who were 20 years old in the 80s and 90s, a whopping 26% of the millennial generation now in their late teens and 20s claim no religion, 26%. From 3% to 26% in my career is a very large change. Now it has to be said that in spite of the sea change in institutional loyalty, the general beliefs of 20-somethings have actually not changed that much in the past 50 years. 20-somethings believe in God, pray, and expect some kind of an afterlife in about the same proportion as their parents and grandparents did at their, at their age. These are not secularists, secularists who believe that their spiritual side is non-existent or unimportant. Indeed, they often say that they are spiritual but not religious, meaning that they do think they have a spiritual side, and it is important, but it is not as dependent on dogmas, institutions, and specific beliefs as their parents imagined it was. Two issues make them particularly impatient with 
those religious institutions. We're now talking about Gen X and, or, and millennials or people 40 and under are particularly impatient with religious institutions. These young and younger adults overwhelmingly believe that sexual orientation is a normal human difference, not a sinful behavior, and they overwhelmingly believe that there are lots of paths to salvation, not just one. That is to say, while there are fewer young people interested in joining churches at all, ours or anybody else's, than there ever were in previous generations, it appears that lots of those who might ever join a church would be attracted to us. That is, if we got really serious about being a religion for seekers and not a religion-free church and serving the religious needs of the people who come to us. Well, I went on and on in that vein. I talked about some of the projects we had done here, our branches and our use of video and our use of the internet. But I also said, as, because that's what I'd been asked to speak on, I also said, as clearly as I knew how, that all those toys and tricks our video outreach, our hospitality practices, our willingness to do the hard work of growth, all that was secondary, I felt, to the real reason for our success, and this church has almost doubled in size in that same 20 years in which the rest of the denomination has been stagnant. Our success is due to the fact that we see ourselves as one kind of religion, a non-dogmatic, open, curious kind of religion, and we offer people who come to us tools and opportunities to grow in faith in that kind of religion, a religiously diverse, curious, non-dogmatic community. After the lecture, a young woman came up to me, urgently wanting to talk. A new minister, she had occasionally preached at one of these tiny Unitarian churches in, in New England, in Dover, Massachusetts, as a matter of fact. A little clapboard building in the center of this town, an empty icon of a New England parish church. The church was 300 years old. It had three members, all over 70. <laughs> the ladies took a shine to this energetic young minister, and they told her that they knew that church as they had loved and known it had come to an end. And instead of closing the church and giving the endowment to the City Historical Society, which they had considered strongly, they proposed to spend that endowment down on a three-year project to redevelop the church for the future, and they wanted to hire her to do it. <laughs> Turns out that this once sleepy New England town was on the edge of Boston's growth curve, and this gal eagerly took the challenge. She'd spent a year hanging out at Starbucks and talking to people while the church was fixed up a little bit on the inside, because as you can imagine, not much attention had been paid to infrastructure. And she had an interesting plan to go with. We're going to stay in touch, so I will update you on this project periodically. At the moment, I wanted to return to the courage and the vision, even the sacrifice, of the remaining three members of the first parish of Dover Unitarian. They faced a sort of cultural devastation, too, the end of their church as they had known it for most of their lives. They looked change clear in the eye and put out all the creative energy they had into imagining that something else might be possible, something that might not meet all or maybe even any of their needs, but which would give new life to an institution that had been important to them. I have to salute them as persons of particular and not common achievement, the ability to face the future with clear eyes, creativity, and hope. It was a winter of odd weather everywhere, did you notice? With many records broken. Chicago had its blizzard of the century. Albuquerque had its record cold and now drought. There were fires in Australia and an earthquake in Japan. In April, the largest tornado outbreak tore through the south, and that new record was shattered only two weeks later with yet another outbreak. Last week, the deadliest tornado since modern warning systems were put in place devastated Joplin, Missouri. There is no straight line proof that all this is due to climate chaos caused by human industrial activity because tornadoes are, well, just too chaotic to study and because the idea that earthquakes might be happening in larger number because of the melting of the polar ice caps and the change of weight on the Earth's tectonic plates is too new to be proven. 
It's unlikely that we will ever be able to understand all these forces, and it probably doesn't matter because our current political process lacks the clear-eyed will to look into the future and make a course correction at the national or global level, even with the information that we have. The future, which is always going to be somewhat different from the past, looks to my eye to be quite fraught. And the resources that we have at the national political level to deal with this are clearly not up to the task. I had my moments on sabbatical of dread. And while I was having all these experiences, you, the members of this congregation, voted to continue the process we began three years ago, the building project. This is a process which has a very practical, physical goal, more space under roof to serve this congregation which has grown so sturdily over the years, space which will help us live our truth, share our values, and organize ourselves to serve the world, however it changes in the future. You've got pictures now in your mind's eye, plans for raising the money and wooing the city into agreeing that this everybody's best interest for First Unitarian to have a larger presence on this corner. But a building project is much more than a physical envisioning of a congregation. It requires such enormous resources of time and money and talent. It is also a referendum on the congregation itself requires a large proportion of the congregation to ask themselves if they believe that this institution will be a faithful servant to the needs of the future, if it will continue to serve the values that we share, whatever happens around it in the uncertainties of the future, if in short it's worthy of all that time and money and attention, and you said yes by a very large margin, and I was very glad. When I require myself to look at the future in the eye, I'm reminded of the words of Cornell West, African-American historian and philosopher. His definition of optimism is believing that one can keep on doing the same old things that have brought poor outcomes in the past and expect good outcomes in the future. <laughs> By this definition, the seminaries who are continuing their resident programs, the Native Americans who believed that the buffalo would come back, those who insist that this chaotic weather is just a fluke and will go away, and we certainly don't need to change our way of being in the world, those are all optimists, doing what they've always done, but expecting a different outcome. And that's not for Cornell West. I have lived in a black body all my life, he said. I am not optimistic. But I am a prisoner of hope. I am also not optimistic about the future but I too am a prisoner of hope. I believe that even a radically changed future will have love and beauty, creativity and growth. One reason I believe this is that I do see how resilient, courageous and creative human beings really are in the face of matters as large as the end of the world as they have known it or the destruction of everything they own and as relatively minor as a necessary change in the way they've always done things or the reality that what has served them well will not serve the next generation. Hope is that things can actually change. Hope is that if we keep hold of our essential values but let go of what no longer serves us, as Plenty Coops did, we will survive. Hope is that if we find a new way to do what we've always done in spite of criticism, as Meadville Lombard is doing, we will thrive. Hope is that if we look past what we need and ask what the world needs, as three members of the First Parish of Dover did, an institution that has served us will survive. Hope is that we'll get over the divorce and find love in the future, that we will face terminal illness with love of friends and family, that we will learn to live without the sugar or the alcohol or the cigarettes and thrive anyway. Hope is that if we embrace a different way of being Unitarian Universalists, as we have done here, that we can attract and serve an uncertain future faithfully and well. Hope is that the human spirit will prevail, that creative adaptation will serve and love community and value will be with us all our days and into the next generations. And that's how to face the future. Our closing hymn.